At this stage, I could really just have laid a laminate and been done with it all, but that wouldn't have been complicated enough. So instead, I started stripping out the wall plasterboards, taking care to cut it out in large-ish sections to avoid creating too much loose, crumbly debris. An oscillating multi-tool is an absolute must-have for this kind of work. Wherever you have two plaster boards meeting on an external corner, you also have an angle bead. This one's metal and it's a pain in the backside really to get the plaster boards off if they're held in place by an angle bead like this that is in turn nailed into timber frame below. So I'm going to try to pull this off first. That should make um, getting out the plasterboards a little bit easier. So looking at the insulation in there close up, probably one of the most inefficient ways to insulate something because this is fiberglass. And if you don't really put it in there, or if you start bunching it together um, and compacting it, then it loses its insulating qualities. It's more of the same here, so it looks like my initial thought that um, it's poor insulation and in these slopes and in the window cases, casings, whatever, and it's um, responsible for the cold temperatures in here in winter and it getting quite hot in here in summer, and it is probably true. So I'm going to take this bit off now as well. I think I'm going to try out stuffing this with rock wool. I think these days, if this was a new build, they would just use poly iso and then create vapor barriers, but um, this house is leaky as all hell. So I'm not going to start with that because I don't think it would make much of a difference. Still have tons of rock wool left over, so I think that's what I'm going to use. The R value is probably not as um, well, not probably, the R value is not as high as uh, probably ISO, but it's high enough and also has some sound dampening qualities. And to be fair, things can get noisy around here with the tractors, the cows, um, crows, they're noisy. Putting rock wool in there at the end of the day, that's not that bad a thing to do. One other thing I like about rock wool slabs is that they are the right blend of rigid and flexible. Flexible enough to wedge them between timber studs and rigid enough to retain their slab shape that is so easy to work with. Also, it doesn't squeak like poly ISO does. It doesn't squeak at all. All of the slopes and the window casings have been de-plasterboarded and I've insulated them all with uh, rock wool and now I've stripped the plasterboard off of the, uh, the masonry there and the way the plasterboard was fixed to the masonry was um, just with spot glue so these splotches of um, some sort of construction adhesive they were just uh, yeah, splotched on the wall and then the plasterboard just uh, pressed onto them so they're a bit of a pain to remove and that has to be done the old-fashioned way with a mallet and a flat chisel I've now stripped the plasterboard of all of the masonry walls and will now start to put on a lattice I suppose of pattern strips to then slot in some uh, insulation and then to re-add new plasterboards. That nail gun I'm using is not strong enough to securely fix the battens in place against the masonry, but it does hold them there long enough for me to hammer in proper masonry nails which will secure the timber. I start with a 2x2 two two outer frame around the edges of the bare wall. Once finished, I add two horizontal battens from floor to ceiling to give the new plasterboards something to be affixed to later. I'm 
So now the main battens are in. I just put in these vertical ones here. They're, um, they have 120 centers. That's because my um, insulation panels are all 60 by 120. I cut them to those sizes to be able to transport them in my car. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fit them in and then I'll put cross members horizontally um, and that way I also have enough timber to screw the plasterboards into without having the metal wobble free. I think that's the best option will probably require the least amount of um, insulation panel cutting because of course with 120 centers a distance from one stud to the other is not 120 it's more like 116. I'm gonna leave that corner here alone for a moment because there's some more fixing work there that'll have to be done. I think this wall is trying to lean out a bit which is why they put in these these massive brackets here but there's definitely gaps in the mortar there and I feel a breeze coming through so either I have to find those out an idea of which I'm not too fond or I'll have to mix myself some cement um, and get it in there but in order to do that in a meaningful way um, I'll have to widen that at first a little bit as it is currently that cracks too small to do any fixing work but for now I'm going to get the insulation panels in here and then um, cut some cross members to size and just fill up these wall spaces here with insulation Remember what I said earlier about squeaky poly iso? This is what I mean. now wrapped the insulation around the remaining masonry walls and now I'll start sheathing the walls with uh, plasterboard starting with these slopes next is plasterboards that go against that wall here and then the very last stage I'm going to sheath that wall there and this one here being tall can be a pain most of the time, but it is a clear advantage when doing walls from measuring to sheathing to plastering. The ceiling here is about 240 high, that's 8 foot in the archaic system, which I can still reach to take measurements. Then I cut the sheets to size using a T-square for perfect 90 degree angles and straight cuts. These plasterboards are foil backed which gives them some measure of protection against moisture. As always plasterboards are scored on one side first and snapped along the cut and finally cut through inside a freshly created corner. This works across as well as lengthways. Lifting and holding the boards in place under a slope can be done using a plasterboard lift. I went with a bare knuckle approach or bare scalp approach. Anyway, I used my head instead of a lift. more detailed look at the window casings so obviously these boards are in I haven't um, closed these ones up because first I want to cut off all the foam that the window installers uh, kind of foamed out of the gap between the framework and the windows with and they didn't do a particularly good job I'm not sure if the camera picks this up but it's possible to see daylight through this gap 
Um, there is no draft coming through and that's because on the outside there is a silicone seal, translucent silicone seal, but this gap shouldn't be here. First cut all these bits off to find uh, any more of these cavities then get a nozzle in there and fill those gaps. Um, the second thing I'm up here for is this metal angle bead. So what I gathered is that there is a bit of timber, like a cross member that's sitting on top of here, and that the window frame is fixed to. And on the inside, there is probably a bit of plasterboard here and a plasterboard underneath or something. And this angle bead is just there to make a nice clean plaster finish, except it's not clean. We've always had this coloration and I think it's visible here um, up on this bit and it's because of the rust. Now the question is where, why is this rusting? So what will need to happen is I'll need to pull this off and then hopefully get to the timber behind it to see if the timber is wet or if it's drying all right. So let's say if the draft came in through, let's say a gap between the frame and the window itself, got up here with the moisture in the winter, I made this rust or whether the piece of timber that this is sitting on is wet itself which would probably then come from the outside and that will be a whole different pain in the ass. So I've gotten through to the timber underneath and some water discoloration here but um, it doesn't feel wet to the touch so that's that's good. Um, once again there's daylight there and if I stick my fingers in it, I can't feel a draft. And I think that's due to the silicone seal on the other side again. So once again, I'll need to foam that out. Uh, there is, to truly is a bit of plasterboard here um, from before. And that plasterboard is, is knackered, like it's discolored. So this would have been spongy and it even feels, it, it does feel a bit dodgy. So I'm just gonna pull this out in case there is some some business going on where I don't know maybe some uh, remaining moisture that's being retained by by the material so I'm going to pull it out any cavity I'm creating I'll just fill out with uh, foam once again there's daylight there so I'll have to get in there with a the screwdriver pick that out and then foam this out properly same way all around here and then hopefully that'll end this particular problem but yeah it's a bit of a relief that this doesn't feel i don't know spongy or sopping or anything right time to case the window alcoves in these are already sheathed more or less and now it's time to do that one to minimize waste I use the narrow plasterboard offcuts from making the slopes to board the alcoves up, checking with the spirit level that the edges are perfectly horizontal. Alright, now to cut the axis off, I'll do that from this side. next part would probably be easier if I didn't use such a long piece of plasterboard. But anyway, this seems faster than the alternative. The alternative being using several smaller pieces. This fits well enough. I'm going for it. Uh, of course, we didn't bring any damn screws. Idiot. Should have just moved the box over the last time. So bad.
Yeah, that foam hasn't fully hardened yet. So I can't take off this brace just yet because um, I don't want the foam to push these these um, poly ISO panels out. Yeah, that's solid enough. Off with the brace. Right, and that's solid enough. So now I guess we can start plasterboarding this. That's why I put these um, these wooden blocks here and nail them into the masonry uh, through the plasterboard so that there is something for me to screw into. So my plasterboard sheets are gonna meet on this bit of timber here. So I need to get the measurement from that corner to the middle of this timber bit. like it is 232, maybe 231 and a half. Let's stand at the bottom, for good measure. Yeah, I'm going to go with 231 and a half. I've also put down uh, plastic shims to put the plasterboard sheet on top of, so that it sits just about 5 millimeters off the floor because the floor is wood, joists are wood, there's always some um, shrinking, expanding there and um, I don't want, let's say, any extreme expansion of the wood to press the plasterboard too much and start cracking the wall. Now I'm just making some cuts for the window alcoves. I'll take kind of like a small strip at the top off, about three centimeters or thereabouts. And that has to be done first to allow me to get this sheet as close to the wall as possible. Next, I'm stripping away about 3 cm worth of board to make it fit under the roof slopes, using a straight edge for clean cuts. Next thing is going to take this power plug back off, so that I can have just a back box in the wall. And that's what I need. I need the back box so I can press the plasterboard sheet against it, get the outline, and then make a cutout that fits snugly, snugly around the back box. Now, I just applied pressure against that board. Get like thin sheet metal off the back box, and hopefully I'll have a good outline now. That's the back box. This is the outline. I've traced it with a Stanley knife, and now I'm just going to get in there deep until I can just push this out, and then. Providing everything has gone right, I should be able to just flip the board up and fit it in there nicely and also nicely around that back box. So this seems to fit well enough. That's good. And once again, plumb line upwards. Thirty centimeter intervals, and then fifteen 
The batten strips are level and I've marked the locations on the floor. Using the pencil lines I've just drawn on, I can now screw the plasterboard in while being sure the screws are anchored securely in the timber buttons behind. Recall the last time, so I've obviously cased the alcoves with plasterboard. Haven't done any um, plastering yet, so the screws and the joints are still visible. I've also put the, um, the two big sheets on the wall. Just this one is missing. That's a more complex shape because of the the slide cutout as well as the cutout for the socket. That still should be easy enough. I should be able to get this done tonight. Just after finishing my day job. Two twenty. So I can just um, take the fresh plasterboard sheets, make a cut off at two twenty, and then get this here make a level mark on the side that'll give me the slope cut that off fit it in with a plasterboard that is the exact height of the unsheathed ball i mark the width of the gap at the same level and transfer that measurement to the top this should replicate the slope of the ceiling. technique to do this when you're by yourself that I'm not aware of. Anyway, this work without injuries. Okay. Well that looks a bit shit. Again, an iterative process. Because the board doesn't quite fit yet, I'm shaving a few millimeters of plaster off the top and then try again. Okay. I once again mark the positions of the battens and drive the plasterboard screws into those. Right, now that's this wall sheathed and plasterboard. Time to look at the last remaining one. Which is this one here. I think I spent the last half an hour just staring at the stud work and trying to come up with a pattern that is staggered. Well, I don't have any, any cross joints, but only T joints for more stability. So I now know where I want my joints between the plasterboard sheets to be. So I can now start cutting my sheets to size, offering them up and fixing them on. Carrying full plasterboard sheets up those narrow stairs is an absolute pleasure. I'm enjoying myself quite a lot.
Right. The last piece is going in now, and this is the most complicated. I think I found three attempts so far, and then um, had to shave a little bit off the top because once again the ceiling isn't isn't level. It is higher there and it dips down a bit lower there to the middle of the house. So I'll take a little bit off the top and hopefully now it'll fit. And it's not easy to lift, this is almost a full sheet. Um, it's not easy to lift this that high all by myself. Marking the positions of the studs is even more important here. To avoid driving the screw into the heating pipes, I've run into stud work behind. Thankfully, this is the only place with that risk, and it's also one of the last bits of plasterboard I have to install for a good while to come. Mm-hmm. 